Hi, we're attempting to make a video of starting up a boiler feed pump at a power plant. I um, hope this isn't too boring. It's the first one we made and hopefully they have a lot of good information in it. Um, this is just a basic overview of the feed pump. We're going to have actual pictures of the feed pump and we'll also go through the starting up of the feed pump. The basic parts of the feed pump, you have a booster pump, a gearbox, main steam turbine, and the main pump. So you'll notice some of the flows are in KPPH, 1,000 pounds per hour. We also have a lot of gallons per minute. Um, in reality, most of the flows are in KPPH, but we convert to gallons per minute to make more sense to the average person. If you don't deal in KPPH, it's kind of a foreign number. The basic plant, you have your generator, a dairy storage tank. The deaerator heats and removes non-condensable gases from the water. The storage tank is about eight floors above the feed pump. This provides a net positive suction head combined with the pressure up to 65 PSI depending on the plant load. Um, out of your, both your pumps have warm-up valves. These will be closed before we actually start the feed pump. The purpose of these is to maintain the pump temperature by allowing warm water to flow through the pump when it is shut down. Um, these pumps can be started twice a day. Uh, most of the time it's like four or five in the morning. It's about the last thing you want to do is bring the plant up and start a feed pump, but that's when you have to come up to catch peak loads. Uh, the flow through the pump, you your booster pump, you go through feed water heater five, feed water heater six. This feeds your main feed pump. From there it goes to feed water heater seven and up to the lower economizer. There are no level control valves. The level and the steam drum is maintained by the pump speed only. So you have two pumps. One pump will run up to 300 megawatts. When you get above 300 megawatts, you have to start the second pump. And if you come down below 300 megawatts, you have to take a pump off. Um, we are using extraction steam from the main turbine. The reason for this is the steam drum puts out 2400 PSI, 1005 degrees. The steam is partially expanded through the high pressure and intermediate pressure turbines and then it is extracted and used for feed water heating. The reason is as you drop the steam pressure the volume increases. In order to keep the low pressure turbines from becoming too large the steam is taken off and used for heating. This does improve the plant efficiency. If the steam is go all the way through the turbine it would have to be condensed in uh, the surface condenser and you would lose the heat energy. Whereas here we can use the heat feed water and reclaim most of the energy. We have a startup feed pump. This is only used for starting up, filling the boiler and bringing the plant up to about 500 PSI, at which point you can run your main feed pumps. As you can see, it's an 800 horsepower motor, but it's not just 800 PSI, so you're pretty limited what you can do. Um, you need to be up to about 2400 PSI on the boiler drum when you start a feed pump. That the range. You see we have minimum flow valves. These are there to provide minimum flow through the pumps. Uh, we have a lot of horsepower on this pump. It's 14,000 horsepower. So you can develop a lot of heat in the pumps if there's not adequate flow for cooling. These are in gallons a minute and in reality they're in KPPH. On our graphic screen you'll notice it's reading KPPH. Um, it's the same value, different nomenclature. Okay, this is the booster pump. I have to apologize for the drawing. It's not the best, but it is what it is. Hopefully we can convey some of the information. Um, the basic impeller is a double suction impeller. The reason for this, it lowers your net positive suction head and also balances your actual thrust. You have a low pressure in the impeller and since you're pumping hot water, it can flash to steam and cause cavitation. That's why the carrier storage tank is like eight floors above this pump. The water coming in is probably 265 degrees. It's not that hot. Um, you have wear rings on your impeller to the casing. This minimizes leakage on both parts of it. Um, your basic pump design, as the water is flung to the outside of the impeller, it increases, it imparts high velocity to the water. This velocity is converted to pressure. The horsepower of your impeller depends on the volume of water being moved. 
That's why pump startup, you'll shut the discharge valve partially closed to minimize the load on the motor. You can see where you have to have your recirc valves. As this pump spins in the casing, there's a lot of movement, a lot of friction, fluid friction, that will increase the heat in the water. To seal the pump, some pumps will use packing, um, some use mechanical seals. This one uses a watertight seal. These pumps take water from the condensate pump, which is about 100 degrees. Uh, it comes into your gland. Then you have a drain temperature. The drain comes off. You want to maintain about 150 degrees drain temperature. You add more water. Um, they're kind of a labrys seal, fairly tight, so the water comes in. You get pressure drop across each notch in the seal. Um, your pump PSI is dependent on the diameter of the rotor your impeller and the speed it's traveling at. The higher velocity you get out here, the higher the pressure. Now I'm on the double volute part of this pump. You have a volute which converts your velocity to pressure. This high velocity water comes out here and starts slowing down and this gets converted to pressure. A double volute, you have a volute here and you have one here starting. As the pressure is built up in the volute, it creates a radial thrust on the shaft. By having a cut water here and a cut water here, it balances the radial thrust. You have high pressure here and high pressure here. So it balances out the pressure on the that radial thrust on the pump. Especially higher pressure pumps sometimes use diffusers. You have a whole bunch of diffusers that spread the load, or at least go a double volute. Okay, here's the steam turbine for our boiler feed pump. Um, if you're confused by this, don't worry, so are we. We probably have too much information on this and we'll try to muddle through this. Basically, it is a reaction turbine. Turbine. Um, inlet pressure is 150 PSI, it can be 600 degrees. It's getting its steam from the intermediate pressure turbine exhaust before it goes to low pressure turbines. The backup is the high pressure steam. It's coming off the boiler main steam line. It can be up to 2400 PSI and 1005 degrees. This is normally used for startup. Um, if you have 500 pounds boiler pressure, you can run your feed pump. The gland sealing steam on this turbine. The, low, the vacuum side, you have to put steam in to prevent air in leakage. So you bring sealing steam in, part goes this way, whatever leaks out and any air coming in you pull out to your gland steam condenser. This is under a slight vacuum. The pressure end, you have steam coming out here that can be used to seal the low pressure end, self-sealing, and any excess goes down to the gland steam condenser. Um, basically a turbine converts heat energy to mechanical energy. Um, a lot of people think that's just the pressure, but it actually is the heat energy is getting converted. Coming out of your high pressure turbine, It'll be 600 PSI, about 600 degrees. It goes back to the boiler as reheat. It'll heat that to 1,005 degrees, and that comes back in an intermediate pressure turbine where that heat is extracted and dropped down to about 150 PSI and about 600 degrees. Um, the bearings in this turbine, they're tilting pad, general bearings. The reason for that is better stability of the bearings and a better stability of the oil film. Um, your oil wedge is about a thousandths of an inch thick. Uh, it depends on temperature. That's why temperature is so critical on bearings. If the oil is too hot, you have too thin a film. Too cold oil, you have too thick a film. They can create vibrations and problems on both ends. Too cold oil can actually be worse than too hot oil. Your oil removes the heat from the bearing. You have film, shear, and you also have a lot of heat coming from the just the physical heat of the turbine. Uh, 600 degrees here is going to transfer heat down the shaft. That's why you don't take oil off a turbine after you shut down to your temperatures are well below 300 degrees. Um, the control system, we're using electrohydraulic control. This is basically a hydraulic control system. It has 1600 PSI to run it. All your valves are run from the hydraulics. The key to the trip header, you have a dump valve. At low pressure, this valve opens 
and you'll dump the cylinder pressure to the EHC. The spring compression forces will slam these valves shut and your turbine trips very quickly. The key to the trip header system, you have orifices. There's an orifice on the EHC coming in and an orifice on the turbine lube oil. The one valve that ties the two together is your interface valve. It uses lube oil pressure to close your interface valve. If your interface valve opens, it will dump the trip header and these valves slam shut. So if you lose lube oil, it basically protects your turbine. Um, you have your mechanical trip, which is a bolt or a weight in the shaft at a certain centrifugal force. It flies out, hits a lever, and dumps the oil. When you latch the turbine, you close your lube oil drain and your EHC drain. So latching, it actually allows EHC fluid to these control valves so you can operate your turbine. When you trip the turbine, electrically this, this opens and this opens, it dumps it and it's very fast. Uh, the turbine trips, you have your overspeed, you have electrical and mechanical. This is the bolt that will come out of the shaft and strike the trip lever. Discharge pressure, this is to protect the piping in the system. Main oil pressure to interface, that's set for 35 PSI. Oil starts dropping on this line, it shuts it down. Low, low reservoir level, 34 inches from top. That's to keep your little oil pumps from cavitating. Make sure you have oil flow. Exhaust vacuum, 14 inches of mercury. Um, thrust bearings, minus 12 to plus 12 mils. That's very important. The clearances in the turbine between the wheel and the reaction stage of between the wheel and the diaphragm are very tight. I've heard reports at 18 mils they can actually start hitting. Anytime you start up a turbine, you're watching your rotor position versus the casing. Uh, if you heat up a turbine quick, your rotor will grow faster than the casing and you can hit. And if you cool it down, your rotor will contract quicker. So how fast you heat up a large steam turbine is very critical. Bearing metal temperatures, 225, that's pretty standard. Um, the problem you have, as this gets hot, Babbitt starts getting really soft at 300 degrees. It can start melting up about 400 degrees. So you're, you're without oil film, good oil flow, your Babbitt will get hot and start melting. The Babbitt's a tin-based metal. Um, it traps dirt, and in case you lose lubricating oil, it will protect the journal bearing if it does hit. Okay, it's time for show and tell now. This is a diaphragm stage or nozzle block for a steam turbine. As you can see, they're aerodynamically shaped. Uh, the steam comes in and you create a high velocity jet leaving. Usually you want your steam about twice the speed of your wheel speed turbine blades. Uh, here's a turbine blade. <clears throat> you can see the root. This is what goes into the rotor, this part. Um, it's kind of an aerodynamic shaped. It's probably more of an impulse stage. A lot of times you'll have impulse on the root and reaction in the end of the blades at low pressure turbines. Stellite strip has been soldered on to prevent erosion. Um, they're basically an airfoil, all your turbine blades. <coughs> this is a labyrinth steam seal. Uh, obviously it did not come off this machine, it's a lot bigger. But you can see it has the variations in height. Uh, the rotor would sit in here, the little raised parts. It creates a torturous path for the steam so it's to come up and down that drops your pressure across here. There's several different ways of sealing turbines nowadays. This is one of the older style, this works, but all this stuff, there's a lot of new technologies and a lot of different ways it's being done nowadays. This is probably actual blade off that feed pump turbine. It's kind of hard to see, but it's very curved. It's definitely a reaction blade. Uh, the big thing with turbines is trying to keep steam leakage between the stages. So use a lot of sealing strips. Um, we showed, we didn't really show the sealing strips on our one diagram, diagram there, but the key is to keep steam leakage to a minimum when you're going through the turbine. Here's the main feed pump basic components. You have the barrel, you have the volute casing, you have the end caps. Um, the barrel is designed to withstand tensile forces 
So the discharge pressure is between the barrel and the volute casing. The volute casing is under compression. Uh, it can be thinner metal and it's easier to disassemble and work on. So the barrel takes most of the force. This part of the barrel has discharge pressure. This part of the barrel has suction pressure. From the video, you'll see they have super bolts on the end holding on to the head of it. You have a first stage impeller. This is a double suction to minimize net positive suction head. As the water coming in is 360 degrees, 500 PSI. You have a second stage, a third stage. Over here we have the fourth and fifth stage. They're in opposed groups to balance the axle thrust. There's very little actual thrust on the first stage. Um, over here you have a booster stage. This takes the discharge from the fifth stage and pumps it up to provide water to the finish and division wall sprays. Uh, some plants will call them temperators, we call them sprays. Wherever you work, it's going to have different terminology, so that's what you have to go by. Um, the main feed pump, it has five pump stages. You could do this with a single impeller, but the size would be impractical. So we've used five stages instead of one to accomplish the same effect. Just like a well pump, you add more stages to get the required lift and feet or the discharge pressure. The shutoff head on this pump is about 7,700 feet, which is pretty impressive. The seal on this pump uses water. Um, some pumps use packing, some use mechanical seal. This pump, it comes off your booster pump around 360 degrees. Part of the water flows into the pump suction Part of the water will come here and go to the deaerator drain. This goes back to the deaerator. You have water from the condensate pump, flows this way along with this water. These go to the deaerator. This water is about 100 degrees. Any water that leaks off goes to a drain down to the Glen collection tank, back to the hot well. Um, both ends of the pump have suction pressure. So the high pressure discharge is isolated from the seal part of the pump.